It is a great song. So, okay, cut it out. We'll play it later. <laughs> so, when they first told me I would have been in festival stage, I've asked, are you sure it's not fuck up talks? Because, you know, a lot of people might tell you I've done a lot of mistakes in my life. I'm probably there, right? For sure, my life so far has felt a bit like a roller coaster, as you know, on lots of highs and lows, and it could be scary at times. But that's only until you realize that's exactly how roller coasters are supposed to be. At that moment, you can let go of fears, sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. So before starting, I want to share something with you that is completely off topic, which will make the organizer much happy for the time I'm burning. But it might help you actually assess your ride and let go of your fears. And it's called the Fuck Up Manifesto. It's a list of 24 items that you can use as a handy checklist to assess your ride and actually start enjoying it. In case you wonder, I have them all, and in some cases, more than once. My ride brought me here today, so I guess not everything was wrong. And it brought me this new story, a story that I'm going to share with you, and that, as we just said, very appropriately is related with the reason why this conference is called the way it's called. The importance of the first impression. It's about seven, yes, but sometimes it's a fraction of a second to make a first impression, but that it could last for years, forever, and it could influence the trajectory of our lives for the year to come. Personally, I've been dueling with first impression all my life. You know, everyone from my girlfriend, my friends, even my mom, at least once in their lifetime had told me something along the line of, you know, when we first met you, we weren't really sure we actually liked you. <laughs> but then eventually, you grew on us. And then I received this, which is the best untapped feedback I've ever received. You know, people hate you by the way you walk through the corridors. I hope you're not hating me now. I still have no idea of what that means. But it was 24, and this was my boss. So it was, it's not the first stepping stone you want to be standing on. But beside my personal quest, First impression and the way in which it's formed, it really influences our life, not only as professionals, but as society. Let's think about business. What's the most important thing that every organization needs to have in order to prosper, or at least to exist? The most important thing is the ability of continuously creating value to an ever-changing context. And since the context, where society is always changing based on technology, generation, culture, and so on, the most important thing that any organization needs to have is the ability of creating innovation, which incidentally, it's also the most difficult thing they could aspire to do. Every year, more than 30,000 new consumer products are launched, and 95% of them fail. And if you ask anyone what's their failure rate in innovation, they'll probably tell you anywhere between 70 and 90%. So here's the question. Why does innovation fail? And even more, why those companies that were incredibly successful suddenly stop innovating and fail? I know it sounds like a trillion dollar question. If only we had the answer, it would be your next Steve Jobs or Jeff Bezos. Well, I'm here to tell you that the answer might have been here in front of our eyes for all these years, but somehow we refuse to see it. And it's related with first impression and the way in which we form it. But first, I know you all have another question in your mind. The hell are you exactly? Fair point. So <laughs> I started working on a Juno 13 years ago, fresh out of business school. I joined one of the big five consulting firm. I created for them the very first innovation and digital transformation strategy. Then I became vice president of a big IoT multinational. I created and mentored startup. And then I went back to a second big five just to really make sure that, that was in my path. And now I'm here. And over the course of the years, I had the opportunity of working with some of the most amazing companies and entrepreneurs and people in the world on the precise moment in which they needed to let go an existing paradigm to embrace a new one. So I witnessed firsthand why innovation failed. And trust me, you know, they pull it all out on me. So I really, really know what I'm talking about. But I'm not asking to you to trust me. I'm an absolute no one. There's plenty 
of, resort, of research of literature. This one is a very simple chart published by Harvard Business Review on the most common blocks of innovation on a large company. And if we can start looking at it, a pattern surface and a different picture to what we might think. You know, typically when we talk about lack of innovation, we tend to label it on lack of creativity, as if not enough good ideas were created. But the data about you know, thousands of results consistently show that innovation is a cultural matter. The problem is not ideas generation, but idea selection. If we observe, and you can add, you can add Toys R Us, you can add Motorola, you can add all the great companies that failed, their trajectory, we will be able to observe a certain point in time in which they fuck it up. Instead of opening up to a new paradigm, they doubled down on a failing strategy because they were close and trap in groupthink, and they failed. So another question, why that happens? We're talking of some of the most amazing minds at that time. Why, why this company failed? I'm here to tell you. It's related to, to how our brain works and how we form our first impression. So we all know that we have two hemispheres in our brain, right and left. The right one is the funky one, the one that perceives all existence as a continuous flow of energy. There's no difference between me, you, the stage. And it's the one that's typically associated with creativity, with intuition. And then we have the left hemisphere, the one that is serious, the one that determines that I'm here and I'm different than you. And it's mostly commonly associated with complex reasoning and mathematical uh, operations. Oh, by the way, if you haven't, just go look up for a beautiful TED talk. It's called The Stroke of Insight by Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor. That's absolutely mind blowing. But maybe we don't know that we also have two ways of reasoning a scientific way of reasoning, an intuitive way of reasoning. Scientific reasoning is the one that we apply to a complex calculation, 75 times 124. We cannot guess the result. We can guess that it's not 85 or 85 million, but in order to get to the result, which, by the way, is 9,300, we need to follow religiously, actually scientifically, the passages until we get there, regardless of what we think. It's a very conscious, aware, and um, resourceful type of reasoning, deliberate. And then we have intuitive reasoning. Intuitive reasoning, it's really interesting, is what makes us different to one another, from one another. And it's based on heuristic availability. It's based on our culture, our cultural framework, what we've been doing for the past 20 years, or in my case, 37. And it's immediate, it's unaware, and it's effortless. Have you ever been walking through the park or watching a game with a long-time practitioner of the sport. While you try to make sense of what's happening on the board, that guy could go checkmate in three. And you're there, you feel like a fool, and it feels like magic. But that's not magic. That guy, heuristic availability, has thousands and thousands and thousands of patterns that he can foresee and recognize to see how the game will end. That's why they say former Athletes are the best coaches. And this could be very useful, but also a very slick, a tricky limitation to have in fast-changing context. As I said, it's inevitable. Just we cannot avoid overhearing the loud guy that speaks on the train. You just, you just simply cannot avoid it. And what happens is that intuitive reasoning influences 99.9% .9 period percent of our reasoning even when it's about the time to select scientific reasoning. Let me give you an example. What if I ask you who's going to win the NBA Finals? We all, if you have any knowledge of the sport, we all have an instant favorite like that. And that intuition will influence even your choice if I ask you, let's bet a dollar on it. This is a very complex question that requires scientific reasoning. You'll need to go through the statistic, when Stephen Curry is not right, when they play in altitude, and, and then you can get to the result. But what typically happens in the moment of needed change, we tend to substitute a very effortful type of reasoning 
with, a, with an effortless one. Scientific reasoning burns a lot of glucose in our mind. Our eyes get bigger, the pupil, the heart rate increases, our muscle tension. It's not sustainable or long, over a long period of time. But intuitive reasoning is. So these are a few of the most famous quotes of what typically happens if you imagine of being running a company for 25 years, and then someone comes there and says, you know, mister, we might need to change it. How, how, how fun for them and how, how easy for them you think that might be. So innovation is cultural, as we said. And if innovation fails because of groupthink and conformity, we should be able to observe better financial results to those companies that are actually more diverse. And in fact, we can. And not even of a small amount. Companies that are more diverse for gender, career path, industry, uh, background, and whatever, outperform more, let's say, groupthink-based company by 20%. Not two, 20. This is a great example of a company that almost failed. You, you, you remember that guy with Nokia? That was Steve Ballmer, the previous CEO of Microsoft. This guy came in, and he started talking about cultural mindset and diversity and growth mindset. And Microsoft became the first trillion dollar company ever, based on this, because they knew that they needed to scientifically question what they know constantly. So people management is crucial. But unfortunately, people management is also one of the realms in which intuitive reasoning is more predominant. Chief executive knows that this is fundamental, and they never spend enough, like, as much money on this. But quite frankly, they've never done such a worse job of it. So let's see how the process unravels. First of all, I don't know how many of you have been taking job interviews, but cultural fit is a recurring, is a recurring um, thing that is assessed over and over again. It's not only counterintuitive. If diversity brings innovation, and innovation brings success, you don't want to be hiring based on cultural fit. You want to be hiring based on cultural contribution, because if repetition makes good, it will never make new. And even better, even if we're able to determine what our culture is, because of my heuristic availability, my interpretation of this company culture is going to be completely different than yours, than yours, and than yours. True, Yasmin? Is that true? So this advice which is like, it's the most meaningless advice you receive millions of times. Even if I'm able to think like an iron manager, I'll be thinking like my own iron manager, not like you or you or you. So let's see what, they, what they're looking for. These are the recurring topics and elements most important in any hiring process. Work experience, and then we see first impression, which is already mind-blowing at second position before education and before professional qualification. But then we dig a, di bit, a bit deeper, and we know that 40% of our manager knows who to hire within the first 90 seconds. And I don't care who you are, you're, it's impossible that you can assess how good I am in 90 seconds. And then we know that less than 40% of the companies perform scientific testing on candidates. And even when they do, they don't care about it. And that results in terrible hires. Let's see what they look at. 71% of emplo employers say that even if it's a strong candidate, having a tattoo will put them off. If you have a person, 70% will be put off, even if you're a strong candidate. If you put makeup, she is doomed. She has a makeup and a tattoo, and she's, she's, she's never going to get a job. You, <laughs> you're off. Then dress sense. I mean, how can you determine what's the appropriate dress sense there? Your sense, your, 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 your idea of the appropriate dress sense is completely going to be completely different. The truth is, as soon as they meet you, people will quickly ask themselves two questions. Can I trust this person or can I respect this person? So they assess you on warmth, the personal dimension, not only how sociable are you, but also how trustworthy are you, your morality, and so on, and how, and on how competent you look. And this is a fraction of seconds. But unless 
until a few years ago, this will, would have happened when I meet my interviewer. Right now, technology anticipated the moment of the first impression. We all have digital personas around there. So 85% of recruiters base a follow-up with you on what they found online, and 70% reject you exclusively based on what they find online. And right now, there's no way in which we can measure how do we look online. What is the first impression we make? So I run a little experiment. I took 10 of my fellow speakers, very accomplished professionals, and I've asked about 400 people to rate them on warmth and competence, and even to guess what their job was. Let's see how they're doing really quickly. Bob, who's a system engineer for NASA, was doing quite of all right, you know, about average. But then no one with that Mohawk deck smile guessed that he was a system engineer. Only 2.1%. You got to be an artist or a musical producer with that face. Same thing with Tyrona. She's a bit better, but no one guessed that she was part of a leadership team. She's very competent to be an assistant. She's very competent to be a teacher or an art director. So these are the subconscious bias that we all have. Same thing with Josh, with that hair and that shirt, he's a professional skater, for sure. And I don't care, you know, this is not, yeah, it might sound amusing, but this is based on economic principle that won the Nobel Prize in 2013. It's called the wisdom of the crowd. This is who they are at the first impression. Let's make another experiment together. Let's say you and your company want to hire a CEO, one of the most important figures in your company, right? someone who will run your operation, grow and mentor your team, and you receive this resume. Tall looking Serbian dude, who is my partner on this. And um, he has a stellar CV, works one of the best business school in the US, graduated at Harvard, MBA at Kellogg, worked with coffee and none. But you will not see his face. You will go on Google, and before clicking on Chicago Harris Business School, you see your eye will be captured by those pictures. So is your impression change? It's a rhetorical question. I know it is. Now he owns an MMA gym. He's actually one of the best MMA coaches in the US. And for some of you, that's unacceptable. Someone who teaches people how to be other people, that's unacceptable. For me, based on my heuristic availability, being a former fighter, someone who's able to teach me how to keep cool and lucid in the moment of high stress, that's definitely a plus. But for someone, that's a no-go, and they will compromise on an amazing candidate. So in order to put some science back in this process, today, we're launching Hireable in front of you. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, you can clap, clap. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's free of charge. You can download it. You can, um, please. Feel free, uh, play around it. It's just the first module. You remember those slides with all the five modules that are the most important. We want to tackle them all. And we're going to start with first impression. So you're going to be able, yeah, that, that means some pictures. You're going to be able to upload more, <laughs> I can look at myself, more than uh, four pictures. And based on the assessment on worth and competence, our algorithm is going to determine and tell you what's your higher ability score overall in your industry, in your age group, and for that job title. And not only, our algorithm is going to be able to determine what are the most correlated um, feelings and action which are profiled. Are you admired? Are you envied? Can you expect passive or active facilitation? Passive or active arm? And this is just the first module. But why now? Now is the moment in which the divide, the gap between employers and us professional has never been so wide. Companies think that all we care about is money, but it's not true. We care about purpose. We care about meaning of what we do. We care about continuous learning. And the only way in which we can get back in control and take control of our career is by owning our data. So we can design and plan more meaningful career. Because, look, as I am a living proof of that, it's really easy to fuck it up in life. 
But at least let's try to make sure that that's not for a wrong first impression. Thank you very much. Play the music. This is to Donald Trump. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Great talk. Thank you. That's awesome. No questions? Lots of questions. And I just want to, and I know that we've got some from the audience, but before we get there, Oh, I know um, you. you You're a speaker. You were, part, you were part of the, of, the, <laughs> of the panel. You were one of the 10 pictures. Yes. I've asked you eight. Totally, yes. and I know she's going to have a great question. I'm a speaker and I'm a question asker. Yeah, my own personal my question asker. Yeah. So I, I understand that, you know, you're talking about giving the ability for, for the user, the lack of a better word, uh, to control their first impression yeah. um, online or the digital imprint. But, and this is like a little challenging one. Go. Um, isn't this embedding the the existing paradigms of our concept of what a CEO should look like versus enabling us to have have a, a more open way to represent ourselves. So would you, like if I go in your app, for example, can I go the other direction and kind of experiment in like so a different is, facet of myself? I, I really love your question. So this is a, a journey, right? And you cannot boil the ocean on the first day. You can try in seven, but... Uh, the first step will be get comfortable on owning your data. Right now, you don't know how you look. My mom always tells me, if, can you please look a little different? What does that mean? I mean, I accept that people hate me by the, you know, I don't know, at the first, first but what, why? How, what can I action, right? So the first thing is, how am I perceived? So today, for example, if this was online, I could have used it to determine what's the most liked me in this conference. I'm, I'm completely comfortable wearing a t-shirt, a three-piece suit, or whatever. And it's something, a piece of information that's missing as we prepare our next interview. So this is something that we have. The second step will be shine some light on unconscious biases. So for example, if I rate, I, I, everyone thinks they're fair, especially in this type of environment, right? But then, as that experiment showed clearly, all the women rated by a very liberal and highly educated panel, they were associated with less glamorous or powerful position. So I think it's extremely powerful when you show people, you give them an aha moment. Like, hey, every time you rate someone who could be your competitor or you rate a woman, you rate them 26% lower. And that's the first step. Obviously, we needed to get there as the user gets comfortable. Right? I've tried to talk this idea to people. You're obviously a very advanced user. Other people, they don't care because they, they don't realize that. But as soon as they will realize it, like, it's like scaling yourself. I was a former fighter, and I needed to scale myself to make the cut. Right? But some people, they don't scale themselves. They refuse to collect data. But and, and when they start doing it, then you can prescribe the right exercise, the right diet, the right whatever. So I'm going to ask you a question on sure. that. Um, two things is you just talked about um, collecting data, but also we had uh, the gentleman speak earlier from McAfee Raj around collecting Fine. data. <laughs> and one of the questions from the audience is, why is the app for free? And what are you going to do with the collected data? So the data, good question. And you know, before this, I was exactly in mobility and collecting data on driving style, as the gentleman from McAfee said. Oh, that was depressing. But anyway, uh, the data always belongs to the user. GDPR clearly states that you have the right to do whatever you want with those data. So we are enabled by the user to do anything, which is not sharing the data with anyone, by the way, with you until you want it. It's for free because we're not in this for the money. And for sure, not for the user money. We're here for the organization money that needs the user, they need better professional, needs to embrace a diversity-based culture. So we want them to pay, not the user. But this, you know, the grand scheme of thing, we want to bring some positive change to society. For once, we're already giving away so many data, Brexit, Italy, Trump are the results of the data that have been collected for target fraudulence, most of the time, advertising. 
And we do that without, without caring on what's going to happen to our future. In this case, we can do something better. We can find meaningful yeah. careers. And you know how important yeah. those are. So you talk a lot about first impressions. Um, on first impressions, somebody from the audience has a question for you. Are you stoned? <laughs> oh, no. no that, I could quote Charlie <laughs> Sheen when he, was, when, he was quest, when he was asked, are you on drugs? And he said, yes, it's called winning. It's called being Charlie Sheen. <laughs> so yeah, I'm on the same drugs. But there's a great second question on first <laughs> impressions. And somebody from the audience was asking around, should you lie on your resume? Should you be adding some interesting pieces around hobbies or something to make your profile look better? Or what would you suggest that you do with this data knowing how you might be perceived? I know it's not polite. Let me answer you with a question. What are we all doing today using LinkedIn, for example, or an outer resume? We're trying to put it in a better way. But what we miss is the, is the concrete measurement of what better looks like. We don't yep. know. We what we think it looks better for that industry. We don't know. Right now, what we want to do is to give you a concrete terms of measurement from your picture down. Okay. I, I'm not a big believer in lying, actually, Me never. I, I believe that you cannot fake it till you make it. That's, that's not, I that's totally not true. I totally agree with you. That's not true. If I, if I fake this interest, that'd be terrible. It will be, it will be a sales pitch. And you know, I, I will hate it. So, a, a good friend of mine once said on that: um, instead of fake it until you make it, be it until you are it. Absolutely. So be how you want to be and show Absolutely. up that way every day. Um, but talking about first impressions, I've got to tell you, this next guy who wants to ask a question—that's a first impression. He's like right there saying, "Let me ask." So over to you. Hello. Okay, now it's working. <laughs> Hi, man. Uh, I really liked the presentation. Thank you. I, um, I have a question. You gave this example of the CAO um, where he was an MMA fighter or something like that. Yeah. And you, you gave this uh, example. Well, for a certain company, this might be not, they don't want to hire him because he's an you know, MMA fighter. But in your case, that's perfect because he can be calm, in, be very calm in during very stressful yeah. situations. Yeah. The question is. Should I really care that, my comp that the company doesn't like my MMA? Because if they don't value my MMA skills and so on, then I don't even want to join that company, right? Because you are very sure of what you want to be, probably, and you have a very good idea of your career trajectory. A lot of people don't know. So what we want to have is, I don't know if you should care or not, but what you should have is a measurement of those companies, those industries, for which that is a no-go. So you stop wasting your time. Because a rejection is always stressful, right? Is that, did I answer your question? Yeah, it answers the question. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. I think it's a good question. Thank you. Um, so I know a little bit about you. Mm -hmm. And have you run yourself through this and what came up in terms of your first impressions? <laughs> 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 It depends on the context. Some context, some people, I guess, also here, probably have done a lot of walking, so they probably hate me, like, through the roof. Then, you know, I think it's really useful for me. So the previous startup that I had was measuring driving style. And every time, and I'm Italian, I'm an address driver. But every time I was getting ticket, I react like if, as if it was a non-fair yeah. fine, right? But then, when I started using that thing, I became aware, listen, dude, you, you're, you're constantly speeding. So that changed my behavior. I know it sounds like, yeah, it's something he did, but it's true. In this context, I can't, there's nothing I can do to change the first impression I give because it's more based on your heuristic availability than on mine. But at least I want to know what that is so I can action it. So if you think, mm. yeah, it looks really competent, but it's not warm at all. So I know if I'm really interested in connecting with you, where I should, how I should approach you, right? So can you give me an example on that about a time where maybe you haven't had the best first impression? Or what's the worst first impression you've ever the given? The worst first impression. And People how did told, you overcome that? <laughs> they, they told me you, they hate you by the way you walk through the corridors. What, what, what worse than that? They could have given me a, like a headbutt. But I don't know. <laughs> Best first impression with you when we when we oh. when we had the Skype preparation call. You start you started smiling and you kept that smile for the hour and a half, 
And that's incredibly satisfying because you, you know, it means mm. that we connected because we share a, yeah. a similar background, uh, similar passions. But you know, this is really useful. It's about measuring. That you can do whatever you want with those data because those data are yours. Yeah. Even decide not to do them, but have them is definitely better than not to have them. I think you raise an interesting point on that. It also helps you understand those things that you actually want to portray or those things that you want to be in terms of your authenticity is are you really coming across that way? Because perception is reality, as you've touched on. I think yeah. since you're studying this, I think you can agree not a lot of people are very confident being themselves. Yeah. So that's the first step back to the question that I was asked, right? Yeah. That's the first step. You need to be yourself. And, but then they, told, they tell you, think like a hiring manager, which is actually the opposite. So, <laughs> you know, on worth and competence, again, that's a stretch, the, the, the imagination. Do we really want to be five and five? Ideally. But mm -hmm. let's think about consulting. Let's think about a big tech company in which everyone is a two and a two. Do you want to be a five and a five? A five and a five is a troublemaker on that context. If yeah. that's your pather, pattern, be a two and a two. Find your way of proposing yourself that's like the opposite that I'm doing, like with all the energy and outspoken and political, you know, that type of stuff. Just don't do this if you want to be a two and a two.